Uh, and of course, we know in the original, uh, there was actually no chapters and verses in Revelation. Revelation is just a letter that John wrote to the seven churches in Asia. So I don't know if he wrote it and made seven copies, or if he wrote one copy and someone from the island of Patmos uh, uh, sailed back to the mainland and then brought it to each one church and they made copies sent it to the other, or if they brought it from church to church, probably they made copies, you know, because um, there are lots of people, they had scriptoriums and the ability to make lots of copies of things. Um, so it's probably what happened. But Revelation, 50, Revelation is a letter. And there wasn't any chapters and verses last time you, when was the last time you wrote a letter and you put chapters and verses in your letters? You know, there's no, there's no, you don't put chapters and verses in your letters. So it's just a letter. And so in the original book of Revelation, you read it, it goes right through and there's no, there's no 15 verse one. It goes straight through. Um, and so really 15 is just a continuation of 14 um, and it's really still on the same topic. But the thing that we learn about Revelation 14, why it's so important is you see that there are these three angels that fly in the midst of heaven. They have three messages that God wants to personally give everyone because the 144,000 have been killed, right? They're in heaven. Uh, so that means that they were killed. They were the Lamb on Mount Zion. They've been killed. So the question is, how are all the people on the earth going to know uh, how they can be saved? How are they going to know not to take the mark of the beast? And the answer is God sent three angels. The first one said they had to give the everlasting gospel. He said, fear God and keep his commandments. Um, and worship him that made the heaven and earth, right? It is the opposite of worshiping the Antichrist. And then the second said, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And the third said, uh, the most graphic description of the lake of fire in the Bible, okay? It's that they'll be tormented day and night forever. They have no rest day and night. They'll be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Okay, we learned that, that actually um, uh, Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, was right outside the gates of Jerusalem. Um, and even in the book of Revel uh, the book of, of, of Isaiah, it says they'll go out and look on the carcasses of them that have that have rebelled against me. And it says, "Where their worm dieth not, and their fire is not quenched." And Jesus quoted that verse as referring to hell, as referring to the lake of fire. And so, so we see that God gave everyone on earth a very very clear message that they needed to repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ, and not. Be caught up with the pleasures of Babylon, that wicked city, Babylon, and it's an actual city. We'll get to that. That's in chapter uh, 16. We're going to uh, 16 and 17, I believe. Uh, no, no, 16 is actually going to be talking about the vials of wrath. 17 is going to be talking about Babylon. It's an actual city, okay? Um, and uh, and then the third angel gave this warning: If you worship the beast, if you get the mark of the beast, you are going to be tormented day and night, forever and ever, lake of fire, and have no rest day or night. And so they had a very clear warning. And then what happened? He saw uh, one like the Son of Man sitting on the cloud, right, with a sharp sickle in his hand. And it says he, and the earth was reaped. He said, he said, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so that's Jesus, the one like the Son of Man. That's, called, that's what he's called in the book of Daniel. He's called one like the Son of Man. And so Jesus is, has a sharp sickle, and he's harvesting the earth. Well, what is he doing? He's harvesting all the people who listen to the message of those angels and refuse to take the mark of the beast. Those, that's a harvest. It's a harvest of souls. It was huge numbers of people that were saved. Now, there's billions of people in the world. The majority of people are not going to be saved, but there are going to be large numbers of people who are saved, okay? And so, so it says the, earth was, uh, the harvest of the earth was ripe, and then there's another angel that takes a sickle, and he grabs the vines of the earth. And we talked about that last week. So... Yeah, there's a vine to the earth, and he put it in the wine press of the wrath of God. Okay, and then it says, and blood came out up to a horse's bridle. Now, the wine press of the wrath of God, that's not physical, that's spiritual. The grapes are not physical, they're spiritual. Okay, and it's the blood of the grape. The Bible calls the grape juice blood, you know, well, because it's like blood that comes out of the grape, right? Okay, so. Um, so this is all symbolic of the wrath of God. And remember what the angel said, actually the angel, the third angel, he didn't just say, if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to like a fire. He said he'll drink of the wine of the wrath of Almighty God. That's not referring to the lake of fire, because the lake of fire is mentioned afterward. That's referring to the vials of wrath that God is going to pour out, pour out on the earth. And so we're going to see that, that um, in chapter... Um, uh, yes, we're going to see that in actually verse 1, 
of chapter 15 where it talks about the seven last plagues. And the seven last plagues, that is the wrath that was came out of the wine press of the wrath of God. And when Jesus returns, the Bible says his robe is dipped in blood. And that's a connection back to Isaiah, where it says, Who is he that cometh forth out of Edom? And Edom means red. Okay, we talked about that. And it says, and it says, um, why are your garments red? And he said, I have trodden the wine press of the wrath of God alone. Okay? So the Bible says that Jesus is the one that treads the wine press of the wrath of God. So again, it's the, the, that blood's not physical blood. Jesus is the one that's treading that wine press. And why is it grapes? Well, the grapes are the fruit, right? It's all of the sins and the wickedness of the earth. And so God's judgment, right? If you drive 100 miles an hour on the freeway and the policeman pulls you over and gives you a ticket, you are the one that gave yourself that ticket. If you had driven the speed limit, there would have been no ticket, okay? And so it's the same way. It's the, the actions of people on the earth. It's the sin and the wickedness of people on earth that brings the wrath of God, right? So that's why they took the grapes from the earth and they put it in, it says, outside the city. Which city? It's the city, it's the New Jerusalem city. It's not a city on the earth, okay? Uh, all right, so we already talked about all that, and now we're going to see what happened next after the angel. So this is a kind of a good question. So did anybody listen to the angel? Well, we know they did because, because there was a harvest, right? But how do we know that harvest was people who, who, who were saved after the angel spoke? And that is in chapter 15. So Revelation 15 uh, and uh, verses uh, 1 through 2 first. Uh, uh, we'll read verse 1 first. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now, look at verse 20 of the previous chapter. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, wine even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. Okay, now I go to the verse before, 19. The angel thrust in his sickle on the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. You see? You see how there's the winepress of the wrath of God, and then it's trodden, and blood came out of the winepress, and the very next verse, because there was no chapter in the original, the very next verse says, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So that blood to the horse's bridle is not physical blood. That blood to the horse's bridle is from the winepress of the wrath of God, and it is these angels. That blood is these angels that come out, and there are seven angels, and they have seven plagues. And those plagues that are going to be poured on the earth, which we will study in chapter 16, those plagues... That is the wrath of God that comes out of the wine press. It's all right there. It's just boom, 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 one after another. The reason people must understand Revelation is you don't read it as one continuous narrative. We jump around and we go, I think this means this, and I think that means that. We don't, we don't look at the whole thing all together. Okay? And so it's all referring to the seven last plagues. Um, and so the, now we get into verse 2. Look at verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass. Remember the sea of glass? Remember the crystal, sea like under crystal? That was at the beginning. They're all before the throne, and the, the 24 elders, and they're praising God. And God is sitting on a throne, and there's a sea of glass, right? But it means, you look up the word, it means it's, it's, it's like I work at Cardinal Glass. It's transparent. You can see through it, right? And I told you, I can't prove this. this is what I believe. Why does the Bible tell us there is something clear or transparent? I believe people are looking at the events on the earth and heaven through the sea of glass. That's what I believe. I'm just telling you that's what I believe, because... It, the word means glass is transparent. It's something that's transparent. I believe it's like a window where they can see everything that's going on on the earth. So now the sea of glass is back again. Or it's not, I mean, it was never gone anywhere. It was always there. But he's just talking about other things. Now John is drawing our attention back to the sea of glass. But look at this. <coughs> I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. This is where it's mentioning mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast... And over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Now, did the angel's message have an effect? It did. Because the angel's on the earth telling everybody how to get the victory over the beast and the number of his name and not to worship him. And now, the people who got the victory are where? They're on the sea of glass. They're in heaven. 
How did they get to heaven? They were killed. That's what happened. They were killed because they refused to take the mark of the beast. Now they're in heaven. Yes. What do you think then is mingled with fire? I'm not sure. Um, it's. I mean, John is just telling us what he saw. Uh, so it's possible. It, it has to do with the fact that, yeah, um, yeah I, I don't really know. I yeah. mean, I, well, I would have yeah, never known that a sea of glass meant that they could see down to the earth. So I just thought maybe you knew more about the mingled with fire. Yeah, so now I am just telling you, like, so if you go back to the beginning of Revelation, and again, I'm not going to, I wouldn't, like, argue the point, you know, why is there a sea of glass? I don't know. It's just a sea of glass. We don't know. But I'm saying that the people in heaven are watching what's going on on the earth. That's clear through our revelation. They're singing songs about and talking about everything that's happening on the earth, right? And so people in heaven are watching what's going on on the earth. They're aware of what's going on on the earth. And then, so why do you have the sea of glass? Well, why is it glass? I don't know. I can't tell you for sure. But I'm telling you, like, to me, it's like you can see through glass. The word means it's transparent. I mean, that's what the word, you can look up the Greek word means. Even in English, glass is transparent. So to me, why would there be this transparent sea in front of the throne? Well, to me, and then people gather around, and then people are talking what's going on the earth. To me, the most likely, the most logical meaning of it is that they are looking at the earth through the glass. That would be the most likely to me. Um, so, and so uh, the fact that it's mingled with fire, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, it, what if the fire uh, it symbolizes like God's wrath? You know, that they're watching the, the judgments poured out on the earth and so that's why the sea of glass is like mingled with fire he's seeing fire somehow around the sea or on the sea don't know all i know is they're standing on the sea of glass and they're not getting burned by the fire so um <laughs> so uh mingled with fire and them that had gotten in your notes is then that had got so the word first word is the word glass and the second is the word victory then they had gotten the victory over the beast okay uh, over, over the beast, over his image, over his mark, over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So, everyone who refuses to follow the Antichrist will be killed and end up in heaven. From there, they will praise God while they watch him pour out his wrath on the earth as a punishment on those who worship the beast. Now, the reason I say this is this. There's only one mention of a rapture in the Bible, right? It's when we get raptured. It's the event that's mentioned, right? The sun being darkened, the moon not giving you light, the stars falling from the heaven. It's mentioned in, in Matthew. It's made, well, the rapture is mentioned all over the Bible. Um, and there's some disagreement with Christians about, diff, like, you know, uh, in Matthew 24, is that the rapture, the second coming? And I've told you before, I, the reason I believe it's not the second coming is because the rapture is then mentioned later on. Why don't we take another be left? Be watching the, your son, the son of man comes an hour when you think not, right? Talking to his disciples, right after that saying to be ready because you don't know when he's coming but some people have a different view the other and, and that's okay christians can interpret the bible differently. we still believe the rapture is coming right we all believe the same thing we just argue about the details which is normal because we're all human we all have different slightly different minds and ways of thinking and but the other uh thing about it is when it says that the, he's gonna his elect are gonna all come right and everyone's gonna see him the tribes of the earth are gonna mourn it never says he's gonna come down to the earth and it never says that there's gonna be a battle of armageddon there's no mention of the Battle of Armageddon or the, or the armies of the world coming to fight him. It just says he's going he's, he's gonna to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. So because it never mentions anything else after that, I believe Jesus in Matthew 24 is describing the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the seals. I believe he's describing Revelation 6, um, and he's describing all, uh, all of the events of uh, the first six seals. He's describing all that, um, uh, Revelation chapter 6. Um, because that's what fits the best, you know. The way that you study the Bible is you you took, take each passage and you say, um, how do we understand it in a way where it all fits together, right? And so the best way you can fit Matthew 24 with Revelation and Daniel and these other passages is to say, Jesus is describing all the events leading up to the rapture. He's not describing anything that happens after the rapture. So I'm, I'm just telling you that's the easiest way to do it, the best way, the simplest way. Um, because otherwise it gets really confusing that he would be talking about him gathering his elect and the sun being dark and the moon not giving her light and all that. And then all of a sudden he would skip and he would rewind seven years and start talking about something that was going to happen before that. If you read the whole passage that way, remember the plain sense, if the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense lest it be nonsense. Um, so uh, there's no other rapture mentioned in the Bible, right? So... When you see there are people on earth, and in the book of Revelation, all of a sudden, boom, they're in heaven. Well, how did they get to heaven? They were killed. That's how they got to heaven. There's no other 
way that they're going to get to heaven, right? Because you have, uh, you have, so I mean, you have the multitude no one can number, right? Okay, well, I, I believe that's the nations of, that's the all the Christians that are raptured. That happens right after the uh, right after the sixth seal, right? Um, Revelation seven. But then, when you have more appearances of people in heaven, you have the 144,000. That's in chapter 14, right? All of a sudden, they're in heaven, and they're singing, and they have the Father's name on their forehead. How did they get there? They were killed. That's how they got to heaven. But now, chapter 15, you have a new group of people in heaven, and it's the people that got the victory over the mark of the beast. How did they get there? They were killed. Now, this is where you and I, we got to reprogram our minds. And I'm in there with you. We're all in this together. We were Christians. I live in America, and we don't think of death as a victory. But the Bible says death shall be swallowed up in victory. The people who refuse the mark of the beast and get killed, they got the victory. In the Bible, Jesus said, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. What's the crown for? It's for somebody who gets the victory. We have to get our minds reprogrammed. Death is victory. Death is victory. You see, Christians live in two realms, in two worlds. We live in a spirit world, and we live in a physical world. Now, in a physical world, you want to live as long as you can in your physical body. That's normal. We're all, that, that's normal. In fact, there's something wrong if you don't want to live in your physical body. It means there's something wrong with you, right? Most people want to live. They have an instinct to survive. God gave us all an instinct to survive. So... We believe in self-defense, right? We believe in security in our country, right? If you get sick, you know, you're probably going to go to the doctor and try to get better. Can't guarantee the doctor will make you better, but you will try, right? Whatever happens to you, you want to live, right? You, you, you're driving down the highway and there's an accident and you swerve to miss, you know? Everything you do is to keep yourself alive. That's normal, okay? But we got to reprogram our minds and think we're actually, Christians live in two worlds. We live in the spirit world because we're spirits. We have spirit, we're spirit beings, but we live in the physical world. In the physical world, you want to live as long as you can. So if there's coming a day when all these people are going to be slaughtered, that seems like defeat, but it's not. Because the alternative to dying is taking the mark of the beast and spending eternity in the lake of fire. So what is the victory? The victory is the people who are killed. That's the victory. The Bible describes them as the victory. What about Christians in Saudi Arabia? A person is saved, they're sharing the gospel, they get arrested, they get beheaded. That's victory in the Bible. Stephen preaches his last sermon, and he gets stoned. That's victory. The Apostle Paul is in prison, waiting to die. He says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he goes out and gets beheaded. That's victory. We have to reprogram our minds, don't we? Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. You lose your life, you'll find it. The Bible says, the things that are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, love of the Father is not in him. The things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, things that your body wants, the lust of the eyes. So that's not necessarily saying, the lust of the flesh isn't necessarily saying something wrong because, you know, every time you eat food, that's a desire that your flesh has. Okay? You've got to reprogram your mind, too, to know what the Bible's saying when it says these things. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, things that you see that you don't have that you want, right? The lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, right? So, like, thinking that you're better than you really are. This it cometh not of, it's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Everything that your body wants, that your eyes can see, everything in your physical, your human pride that you would like to become important and be successful and feel good about yourself and have everybody like you, that's the pride of life, right? All the things you want in this life is passing away. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Hey, listen, when you get to heaven, all the things, the physical things that you wanted on this earth are going to seem really stupid when you get to heaven. All the physical things that everybody that you knew is going to be really stupid. The Bible says, the world passeth away in the lusts thereof. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It's a very important principle, but we have to have our minds reprogrammed. 
Hey, listen, God never intended that you become a Christian and you read your Bible and you keep thinking the way you thought before you became a Christian. God intended that you read the Bible, Bible says, be transformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You have to pre-program your mind. You don't become a Christian and then read the Bible and then just go, okay, I'm just going to find things in the Bible and pick and choose things that I can use to win arguments and prove that I'm right or you're wrong. That is not the purpose of the Bible. That is not the purpose of Christianity. Christianity is God wants you to change your thinking after you become a Christian. To read the Bible and let the Bible correct you yourself. And so the Bible corrects us. It tells us, do not live for this life and the things of this world. They do not matter. Now, it's still good to be healthy. It's still good to live a long life so you can serve God, but you're doing it so you can serve God, not so you can please yourself and enjoy life and the pleasures of life. That's not the motive. I mean, the reason that that's so important is if you live for the pleasures of this life, you'll make all the wrong decisions because all your decisions will be based on what makes you feel good now. And you'll have no eternal reward of the judgment of Christ. So it is so important that we reprogram our minds. What do you think when, when Peter denied Jesus? Why did Peter deny Jesus? Because he was scared of getting crucified like Jesus. But you know why, he, why was he scared? Because he was living for the things of this world. That's why he's not Jesus. Listen, all of the sins that we commit is because we're living for the pleasures of this world now. We start to think like this world. And then we wonder, why, why can I never get victory over in my sins? Well, it's because your desires are all for this world. You don't have any desire for heaven. You don't have any desire for reward in heaven. You don't have a desire for people to be saved. You don't have a desire for the kingdom of God, right? So the first request in the Lord's Prayer is, hallowed be thy name. Not hallowed be my name. And then, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is that eternal? But we, we pray this way. My kingdom come, my will be done. Right? God, I want this job. I want to have good health. I want this to happen. I want to marry that hot girl or that cool guy. I want this. I want this. I want this. I want that. God, will you give me all those things? And if you give me all those things, and I have a nice long life, enjoying my life, and a good retirement, and a nice car, and a nice house, everything going smoothly, no problems, then I'll think it's worth it to be a Christian and tell other people how great it is to be a Christian. That's kind of how American Christianity is, isn't it? And then as soon as something goes wrong in my life, well, why would God allow bad things to happen to me? Well, like, Christianity is a joke. It's not real. Because see something bad happening. That's backwards. <laughs> We're supposed to live for eternal things and for heavenly things. So we have to learn how to reprogram our minds. And it's not easy. This is why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man in the kingdom of God. Because a rich man is enjoying life so much that they can't picture something better somewhere else. But, you know how God gets through to rich people? When everything goes wrong. Then they're like, oh wait, I don't have any answers. And then they go to church. Then they go to the Bible. Then they start praying. Because when you have a problem that you can't fix, then you seek after God. And so we have to have our minds reprogrammed. And it says, them, I saw a sea of glass mingle with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast. How did they get the victory? They were killed. And now they're in heaven. So, to answer that question, did the angel's message work? It did. We don't know how many, but we know a large group of people refused to take the mark of the beast, and they were killed. And they got the victory. As you know, when a Christian dies faithful to God, that's a defeat for the devil. I don't know if you know that. It's a defeat when a Christian dies in a state of fellowship and faithfulness to God. It's a defeat for him. Because the devil's goal is to get you to wreck your testimony before you die. It's to get you to fall into sin. It's to get you to abandon your faith and abandon your walk with God and abandon the church and stop reading the Bible. Because then he can make Christianity look bad by pointing to your life and saying, see, that person talked like they were a Christian, but look at all the bad things they did. And then everybody's like, yeah, see, Christianity is not real. But if you're a faithful Christian your whole life and you die in a state of faithfulness to God, and especially, the Bible says, if you die as a martyr, because now you showed that you love God more than your own life. That's an incredible testimony, to die for your faith. And the Bible calls that a victory. Think of all the people watching people be killed. They won't take the mark of the beast. They're willing to die rather than take the mark of the beast. That's a testimony for God. That is a victory for God, and it's a defeat for the devil. We have to reprogram our minds. Death for a Christian is victory, right? Paul says, oh, death, where is thy sting? 
O grave, where is thy victory? The grave and the death, right? They didn't have victory over us. We're having victory over death because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Death is a victory. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, the Bible says. So we have to learn how to think that way. And this is a really good reminder. He describes these people who have died and they show up in heaven and they have victory. Listen, the very second that you get to heaven, you're going to be so glad you're in heaven. You're not going to think, oh man, I wanted to live longer. You're not going to think that. When you're in heaven, you're going to be like, this is what I've been looking forward to my whole life. Um, and so they're in heaven. Everyone who refuses to follow the Antichrist will be killed and end up in heaven. From there, they will praise God while they pour out uh, his wrath on the earth as a punishment on those who worship the beast. Okay. And uh, I can see our time is up. It is 10 minutes till. Um, and uh, what we're going to talk about next week is uh, the song that they sang. It says they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. What's the song of Moses? Uh, and we're going to go and study the song of Moses, which is Deuteronomy 32. Um, it's called the song of Moses, and it's the song of the Lamb. We're going to talk about that next week. The song that they sang, there's an amazing song they're going to sing when they get to heaven. And it connects back up to Deuteronomy 32. Uh, if you look at the wording, it connects to that. Um, but what we need to remember this week is that um, death is a victory for Christians. And so don't look at that time period in Revelation as this is a terrible thing. No, this is people are going to be saved and be in heaven because of the Antichrist. And if it hadn't been for the Antichrist, if it hadn't been for the Mark of Beast, if it hadn't been for those three angels, those people would never have gone to heaven. So God is using all of the wrath and all of the judgments coming on the earth to bring more people into heaven. It's something that I've said before, and I got in trouble for it from Calvinists, but... Um, the thing that I've said many times is God, in his perfect foreknowledge, planned out the history of the world in such a way so that the maximum number of people would end up in heaven without violating their free will. That's how God did it. He's in his perfect foreknowledge. He planned out the history of the world so that the maximum number of people would end up in heaven without violating their free will. So, death for a Christian is victory. Uh, but, of course, we have a job to do here on this earth now. So however God want, long God wants you to live, you'll live. And if God wants to cut your life short, he's got a purpose for that too. Not everybody lives to be old. If everybody lived to be old, then everybody would fool around when they're young. Right? And so that's why sometimes young people die. Sometimes people in their 20s die. Sometimes people in their 30s die. God does that on purpose. You do not know when you're going to die. That way you don't take it for granted. Oh, I'll just live wrong and then I'll change when I'm getting old and creaky and not old enough to do my crazy stuff. And then I'll start going to church and do serve God and obey Him. No. God's not going to give you that luxury. You don't know how long you're going to live. Nobody's guaranteed a long life. And so that's why we have to serve and please God now. So praise the Lord that death is actually a victory for a Christian. And the Bible teaches us uh, we do not need to be afraid of death to live as Christ and to die as gain. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the victory of Christianity. Thank you for the victory that these people have in the book of Revelation. And Father, I pray that you would reprogram our minds, to be, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and that we would look forward to heaven, and that we would live for heaven and for eternity and not the things of this world, and that we would not fear death. Father, I pray that not a single person in this room would be afraid of dying but that we would only be afraid of sinning and of missing out on the blessings that you have for us. And uh, help us to live for you every day because we don't know what day will be our last. In Jesus' name, amen.